CNBC Africa recently spoke with the outgoing NUSPAS CEO, Kurs Becker, a rare interview for him to discuss his legacy and the history of NUSPAS. Here's that conversation. I had a very good run. Mm. I started early. I was head of a company at the age of 32. Mm. And I've now been running a listed company for 22 years. We recently did a survey of listed media companies in the world and we can't find anyone who as an executive had run a company for that period. Mm. So I've had a good run. But clearly you're not losing any energy because although you're stepping down as CEO, yeah. I mean, it's really meaningless, isn't it? Because you're going away for a year on April the 1st, which is a strange day to start. <laughs> and then you're going to come back and be the chairman. Are you going to be one of those chairmen that... It's almost like this Alex Ferguson analysis, analogy that I use with Manchester United. He steps down after a, a career that is unparalleled, but he still sits up in the stand looking down at the new CEO of Manchester United or manager, and that's David Moyes. Are you still going to be there looking down and saying, wait a second, you're doing this wrong? <laughs> Lindsay, hopefully not, and that's the, the reasoning behind taking me out for a year. So if you consider, <clears throat> I've been with the board for a long time. I've worked with the current chairman for three decades. I've built up the management. In 1985, there was one. Then we added my secretary. Then we added five, and so we built the business. So the problem with the new, for a new guy coming in is that all those people could lobby around him. Let's say someone, some executive proposes to Bob Van Dyke, the new CEO, a proposal. Bob doesn't like it. So this guy works me over, <clears throat> tosses me a few ideas. I start biting on the bait. And then he goes back to Bob and he says, you know, Chris likes this. What are you going to say? So that becomes quite hard. Similarly, at the board level, the board might turn to me and say, do you approve this? Do you think it's a good idea? So we thought the best way to structure this is for me to break away for a year and give Bob a chance to bond with the board and with top management. I'll still keep the Tencent connections. I'll continue with Charles Serla, other director on the board of Tencent, but hand over the NASPAS part to Bob. And in a year's time, he should be well enough established and I'll pop back onto the board. So it's all thought through. I mean, it's not just a, a year off for you to have, have fun and try and find the next big thing, because that's what people are putting forward this sabbatical yeah. as. It's actually uh, part of the progression of NASPERS as well. Yes, I think it's... <clears throat> we need to create a bit of a space for the new guy to establish himself. But alongside, firstly, I intend to have fun. Mm. I've uh, had a very interesting life. And I'd love to go to exotic places, eat interesting foods, meet young people. Yes. I think older people are often boring. They f it's like crayfish, you know, they form. Yeah. <laughs> you're hardly <laughs> old. <laughs> but they form as a crust like crayfish. Mm. And nothing penetrates that. And it's, it's sort of self-contained. Young people are open to influences. So I find them much more stimulating. And most good things on the internet have been invented by people under 30. So my idea is to meet good, interesting people, go to places where the future is being manufactured. You know, like uh, Korea is th leading the world in online games and cell phone technology. Uh, in Europe, Berlin is starting to become the gravitational point for the internet, which it is very surprising. It's a pity Cape Town can't do exactly what Berlin is doing. I think we can. Mm. I think we can. Uh, if you consider why something de some place develops an internet hub, San Francisco has no special technology or minerals or whatever. Why did Silicon Valley develop there? It's basically good universities and a nice place to live. Mm. Berlin, the same. It's cheap accommodation, a good nightlife. Um, I think universities play a major role. Young people want to be there. So I think Cape Town has the same. We have three good universities. We have a possibly the most beautiful and diverse countryside in the world, yes. so we can give it a go. And we should give it a go. Let's uh, never mind about the uh, NASPERS at the moment. Let's go back to Kurs Becker, the farm boy, because that's where you started. What's, what was your background? I was remarkably, a um, remarkable local yokel. I went to one primary school, one secondary school, and I was 19 before I got out of town. That was the town of Heidelberg in, in Pumalanga, yes. a small town. And that gave me a sort of solidity. I think it's actually beneficial to know your surroundings and grow up in a fairly enclosed space. Did so it give you the sort of values that you've carried on into your business life? 
Yes, I think the job I do is very close to farming. Mm -hmm. You have an element of interference. So you plant seed, and then you have an element of nature. It's a nice day, it rains. So in our business, you do certain things, and then the environment pops issues at you. You try to solve them. And I think being an entrepreneur is a little bit like farming. It's you, when you start, you do everything. You make the tea, you do the photostat machine, you do everything. And as the business grows, it diversifies. But certainly that improvisation of a farm is extremely useful in business. Yeah. And a strong, close family. I mean, when I come to Naspers, which I do two or three times a year, it seems to me that everybody seems to know each other. And you're very approachable. And people yeah. seem to be content here. Is that the same in your upbringing? To some extent, yes. The benefit we had is when we started MNET in 1985, we were young people mm. in the early 30s, and we adopted a first name policy so everyone was informal. We dressed informally, and it pervaded the, the company. So even today, multi-choice, although it now employs thousands of people, has a certain informality. As you grow more um, established, though, a certain structure invades the company. You also start drawing different people. You start, you know, when we started, we attracted the cowboys people who are very risk, very prone to taking risk. But as you grow, you get people who want to play it safe, who go for a, an established company with an established job. And your task as a CEO is then is to fight that, to try to keep a certain informality, a pioneer spirit, even though you're growing. And that's what we've tried to do. Talk about the Nespers story now. And let's not talk about uh, Tencent for, na for now and the, the fact that uh, a major Wall Street bank just this morning before I came into this interview said that the new price target is 1,770 rand <laughs> per share, which seems to yeah. me extraordinary, but of course not un 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 uh -huh. infeasible. But what was the big break? Where did it start? Was it MTM? Was it Mnet? You were 32, you were running a company. What really defined the beginning of your meteoric career? I think there's always an element of luck and circumstance. I, was, I went to New York, uh, to Columbia University in New York, clueless. I had no idea. It sounded exciting. I did an MBA. And while I was there, I discovered that the, the industry of pay television was being born in the US. No other country had it. It was totally new. I studied it, and in one of my papers at the university, tried to anticipate whether you could launch this abroad. Problem is, abroad didn't have cable. So could you take this technology, encrypt it, and send it over the air and still work? And after I did the paper, I thought maybe we could. Only country I knew was South Africa. So I came back, which I hadn't in, I mean, I left South Africa not to come back. Came back. So that was a lucky break. And then in, uh, we ran six years. Then in 1991, one of our executives, a guy called Ian Wilkinson, went to America. And he came back and he said, you know, there's something, you can put it in the boot of your car and you can make cell phone calls to your secretary. This is wonderful stuff. <laughs> that led to MTN. So there's a certain amount What year amount was that again? 1991. 91. And we, we started got, the planning. And we got it in 94. Yeah. Yeah. It took about three years to establish. And of course, all our calculations were wrong. We estimated 300,000 subscribers when MTN peaked. And now South Africa has more than 100% cell phone coverage. Yes. We have more cell phones than people. Mm -hmm. So we were totally wrong. And then again in 97, we had built up this pay television business in Europe. And a f French company, Vivendi, uh, offered us $2.2 billion for the business, which was totally overvaluing it. I mean, it wasn't worth near that. So you should have sold. We did. So we sold the European part off. And then we had money and nowhere to go because the pay TV, the whole world was occupied. So we then went for internet, which had just been born, the World Wide Web, two years earlier. So there was a certain amount of luck at each phase. Mm. But which of those two was the, the most impactful to you, the MTN or the Mnet story? I think both in a different way. MTN is one today one of the great cell phone companies in the world and the leader in Africa, and it's been a I think a remarkably diverse and successful company across so many countries. Pay television is very interesting. The problems it poses of technology, people, regulation, politics, 
it's an extremely, you know, when you open up your inbox in the morning, you often say, oh God, <laughs> you know, there goes the business. And then you start working through your problems. And I think one of the most delightful things is actually that element of surprise that the world keeps tossing problems at you. And as an executive, you've got to solve them. And I actually enjoy the process. You've always said that the television side of things is going to, has, has either, is going to, it has plateaued, and it's going to become less and less important in your life, in the, in the NASPERS yes. life, and now e-commerce and the internet is, 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 taking, is taking over. Is there then a, maybe a temptation to say, this company's become too diverse now, it's become uh, too big, I have to split it up into various things. I've got to split it up into Africa, I've got to split it up into e-commerce, separate listings. Is that going through your mind? I don't think we'll do it. Uh, you're quite right that pay TV is maturing mm. and consequently you can't expect the growth rates that you'll get on the internet. But curiously enough, elements of pay TV is starting to look like the internet. So if you take a personal video recorder, do you have one of these PVRs? Mm, yes, I do. Now, that's the reason I'm not <laughs> successful, because I watch too much television. So you'll see it records movies without even asking you. It records uh, the cricket test and summarizes it in 10 minutes without asking you. So in a sense, it fakes the internet. So you come home and suddenly the test is available on your PVR. You mm. press two buttons and you watch. It feels like the internet. And as this move accelerates, pay TV and the internet are starting to integrate. So I think some years from now, it'll be actually quite hard to tell apart some elements of what we do in pay TV and e-commerce because they'll use the same technologies. The thing that worries me about this, and I, I see the way that I, I was brought up and the way that my children have been brought up, is there isn't enough time in the day to accommodate all the devices you have. True. The cell phone, the PVR, the internet, etc. Et I mean, I don't know how much you watch. You still read a newspaper on a Saturday yes. and a Sunday morning. Uh, but the newspaper yes. is just one part of your yeah. life that is a distraction. It's very interesting. It's very informative. Yes. And it's very important. <laughs> but it's such a distraction. You can't go for a walk on the beach. Totally and you're true. responsible for that. True. <laughs> mm. But you know, that offers again opportunities, if you think about it. You first. Uh, Take the position, and some years ago, before multi-choice was available across Africa, you are the mine manager in a, at a mine in Katanga. You receive your newspapers four weeks late. You're cut off from the world. Your teenage daughter dresses like two years ago, because that's the influence on her. Mm. Then multi-choice comes and gives you 50 channels. You see CNN the same moment as someone sees it in New York. Your daughter's exposed to fashion TV. Your whole life changes. So. I think the opportunities are to connect people to the world. Now, you've descri described the, uh, the situation of overload. Yes. Isn't there an opportunity there? If someone now comes with an agent that says, Lindsay, we can help you to select the most, most worthwhile elements on the internet. Aggregate everything, in other words. Aggregate it, yeah. reduce the impact on you, make it more digestible. That's a great opportunity. So if you think about it, Facebook connects you to your friends and then you find you spend too much time managing all this and then there's an opportunity actually to for new products. But that assumes then that the person wants to accept the, the advice of this person who is the aggregator. I know that my daughter when she looks at all the choices yeah. she has she's going to say I'm not going to do my latest piece of art I'm going to watch a romantic comedy. Yes. Mm. <laughs> so that's the problem. It's the, it's, it's the will of the human being that is always going to be the, the most important part of this whole equation that you're talking about. True. But I think every situation lends itself to some improvement. So if you, if you say, okay, I need access to the world, we can give you a cell phone to be available uh, to the world, but then you say this intrudes. Mm. Right? I would like some privacy. Then we can maybe create products for you that creates privacy, that maybe refuse to tell people where you are, even refuse to tell people whether your phone is switched on. Right? So access is one opportunity, and then when you've had too much access, privacy is a second opportunity. Mm. <laughs> it's interesting. The next trend, of course, is what everybody is trying to predict. There's a mobile telephony 
uh, conference going on at yeah. the moment as we pre-record this interview yes. in, in Barcelona and everybody's there and everybody's terribly excited about this particular yes. cell phone and that particular cell phone and I was listening to yeah. Gareth Cliff on 5FM this morning and he asked his listeners what do you want to see from a cell phone what will we see from a cell phone and what do you think is going to be the next trend artificial intelligence perhaps what it surprised me is how unpredictability what was mm. for example just before Twitter was developed, would you have imagined that a service that gives you 140 characters would take the world by storm? Mm -hmm. It's very hard to predict. And as I've grown sort of older and more experienced, I've stopped trying to predict what will happen next, but rather I think the best is to scan the world and when something appears, try to pounce on it as quickly as you can. So you're a plagiarist? Yes. In a, in a way. <laughs> You've always said that. Absolutely. You've always said you haven't invented anything. You, yes. you're not that you haven't had an original thought, because you take what it's, what's thrown at you and make it better or adapt it to True. South Africa. True. Uh, but essentially, that's your advice. Have a look at what's happening elsewhere, and if you're an entrepreneur, take it and adapt it to your own circumstances. Sure. Yeah. And I think it's much the same as science progresses. So. Science doesn't work by an individual sitting in a chair and having a great thought that's unconnected to everything else. Mm -hmm. It actually works by aggregation. So you study what people are doing and what seems useful in your field, you synthesize it, and then you add something new to it, or you take it one step further. Business works exactly the same. So Tencent would pick up an idea of, let's say, Twitter, introduce it in China, and then start to extend it and say, okay, could we add to this games or instant messaging or some other refinement? And at some point, you, s you go beyond copying. You actually start to originate and to refresh. And so I think the most productive way of working is actually to identify something that works in some market abroad, copy it as fast as you can, taking care not to infringe copyrights and formal getting into problems and then to try to extend it and improve upon it. And maybe one day you'll become the world leader in some technology.